I'm really pleased to, to say that Dr. Smith is here um, all the way from Oklahoma, um, the Surgery Center for Oklahoma, and they did a very interesting experiment. They posted their prices for the procedures online, and um, I'll let him talk about uh, the impact that's had, but um, I think I'm going to coin a term called reverse medical tourism, and uh, we'll let Dr. Smith uh, uh, talk about that. Y'all hear me? I'm Keith Smith. I'm an anesthesiologist in private practice in Oklahoma City and um, practiced cardiac anesthesia primarily from 1990 to 93 when Medicare decided to stop paying us for doing that, so I quit. I'd also done a cardiac or a pediatric fellowship in addition to a cardiac fellowship, so I had a huge pediatric practice concentrated on that and became increasingly disgruntled with the way I saw hospitals treating patients, treating me, treating the surgeons that I worked with. They seemed to have a knack for running off the really good surgeons and keeping the really crappy ones. So a buddy of mine who's also an anesthesiologist, we basically bought a burnout surgery center on a hunting trip and reopened it and against unimaginable kind of corporate odds. We had big, giant hospital chains, big insurance companies, uh, lined up, locked, you know, arm to arm to keep it from happening, and we did it anyway. Uh, it's been a, it's been a wild, wild success, and um, about four years ago, having, having seen the difference in prices between the surgeries that not-for-profit hospitals charged just across town being ten times what we charged, I thought, you know, we need to we need to get this information out there. The word had already gotten around Oklahoma City amongst the uninsured population. If somebody didn't have insurance and they needed a hernia fix, they would just call. And I would arrange for them to see a surgeon, usually within 24 hours, and uh, just horse trade with them, come up with a price, and we were done. <clears throat> Over time, I'd developed kind of a list of you know, how much are these procedures? How much do these surgeons want? I'm an anesthesiologist. I basically bill for my time. I run the surgery center. I know what the costs are, hard costs and staff costs to do any given case. So I had all the information I really needed to put a kind of a basic price list together. Also, over those years, we have becoming increasingly frustrated by getting, getting <coughs> locked out of insurance plans. None of the insurers would deal deal with us. They would rather pay the bigger amounts to the big hospitals across town. And I got a broad idea. I thought I'd go over their heads. So I went to some uh, CEOs of big companies that had big self-insured plans. So these guys are writing checks on their own, you know, bank account. They have a third-party administrator, you know, that happens to be one of these big insurance companies that has shut us out. And I asked the CEO, well, why would you be okay with paying $14,000 across town for a tonsillectomy for one of your employees' children's when we'll do it for 2900 And that includes surgeon, anesthesia, and facility. And basically, by posting our prices, we showed these guys what we would do it for. And they were able to just compare back and forth how they were getting fleeced. Well, the insurers then started getting pressure from the CEOs, and this whole thing has this whole thing has just exploded in Oklahoma City. Backing up, the first thing that happened when we posted our prices online was the Canadians started showing up, and I think that's fascinating because that's the healthcare system everybody in this town seems to think that we need, and they, the Canadians started showing up because they could pay. I don't know what the price is on our website. I think it's $3,200 for an inguinal hernia. And that's the surgeon, anesthesia, and the facility. And I'm making money. I mean, it's not, it's not, it's profitable at $3,200. And I think that's the price. Um, but they would pay $3,200 from Vancouver to step out of this place in line. That's all they had up there was a place in line. Um, then we had patients come from distant states. Alaska is a nightmare. Washington State is a nightmare, <coughs> Maine, Florida, nightmares, just controlled by big hospital sort of insurance cartel setups, 
and the prices are just ridiculous. They're crazy. So people fly into Oklahoma City, you know, what a beautiful place, and, you know, have their <laughs> surgery, and they're just happy as they could be. Um, but we, we've actually caused some deflationary effects on health care prices in Oklahoma City. We've had four patients now be quoted for four different procedures, the exact price that I've listed on the Internet for these four various procedures. So, Because I always ask people when they call and they've got, <clears throat> they need a knee surgery of some kind, I'll say, well, what was your next best quote? Because nobody else is doing this. And so, you know, I've got my prices out there, and I think they're pretty darn good, but I don't really know, and I won't know until somebody <coughs> else does it. Because until the price war and the kind of pissing match starts, I won't really know whether my prices are good or not. I think they are, but I'm not sure. Well, four times now people have said, well, they quote me $5,685. I think, well, that's a strange amount. You know, and I pull it up the website, and there it is. <laughs> so, and then the patient said, but that didn't include anesthesia and the surgeon. So you're right, the patients are not idiots. I mean, they get it. Um, so anyhow, the, and these are quotes from hospitals that are not known for providing discount care. I mean, these are people that are usually eight or ten times what we are. Um, so we're forcing, there's some deflationary pressure just from this surgery center that I run, you know, with 50 surgeons basically. And um, I see hospital administrators with very fearful looks on their face when I see them in public. And that's a good thing to see. Um, the other thing that has happened recently that's very interesting is there's a third party administrator in Oklahoma and North Texas called the Kempton Group guy that runs it's named Jay Kempton. He's a great guy, and he's a real kind of libertarian thinker and out of the box. Most of his clients are bankers, and they're banks that are big enough to be self-funded, but they're not huge. And they know they're getting fleeced by these not-for-profit hospitals and these cartels. So so they're, they're self-funded. Well, he finds my website, finds our prices online, and said, will you contract with my with my company at these rates and he was in a hurry he was afraid I was going to change my mind and I said well sure yeah I'll, I'll do that well they've made our surgery center the exclusive provider for all of their employees in Oklahoma and in North Texas that includes Dallas Gainesville it's a huge area if the patients come to our surgery center for surgery the bankers will pay the entire bill no co-pays, no deductibles, nothing, because the spread on what they've been paying and what my website fees are such that the bankers are just saving a ton of money. And the patients are thrilled. The first one we did was a vice president of one of these banks had a terrible back problem. We did a two-level disc decompression, charged him $8,500. That paid surgeon anesthesia facility supplies, him staying overnight in the facility. The next bid they had was 60000 so with one case, we saved their health plan fifty grand, um, and that, that, just that information and the, I don't know. We've been with them now for two months. In two months, they felt so confident that this was going to continue to go well. They announced to all of the bankers that for 2012 they would have a 10 percent cut in their insurance premiums, and I don't know where else that's going on in the United States, but these bankers were happy to get the now, you know, they're going to have a 10% cut in their premiums. Um, and it's, it's primarily due to their relationship with our, with our facility and our post having posted prices. So I've not made any friends doing this. I don't get invited to any big hospital garden parties, like you say. Um, but that's, that's not why I'm doing this. I'm, I'm a physician. I do not like dealing with third parties at all. If I had my way, every patient in our facility would come through the doors because through our internet portal. Um, we still deal do, we do, do with, uh, deal with some insurance. We do not take any federal money. I do not deal with Medicare or Medicaid um, and never will. Um, and that's kind of, that's kind of our story. 
Thank you, Dr. Smith. A quick question. I know you don't take Medicare and Medicaid. Do you know how your prices stack up if you paired it against the Medicare reimbursement, say for a knee replacement or something like that? Significantly more. Significantly more. Yeah, the Medicare, you have to understand, the Medicare payments to ambulatory surgery centers are almost always below our cost. The big hospitals lobbied very hard to make sure that that was the case, and then they turned around and, and accused the physicians who own these facilities of being greedy. So my understanding is that the, the compensation from Medicare to a hospital is three to one for the same, but, but it's below our cost. That's one reason we don't do it. The other reason is if you take that federal money, you then have to subscribe to a whole different set of rules and regs that make no sense. And the third reason is philosophically, I consider that stolen property. So we just don't take it. Yeah, I hate to say this, but someone in the Medicare Modernization Act froze the ASCs for 10 years and um, pay about, uh, I think it's a third to two to half of the hospital outpatient rate. I wish they'd reduce it to zero. Seriously, I wish they would cut Medicare reimbursement 100%, and then we can deal with the patients directly. Because this is a joke. They're going to cut it again? I mean, price controls cause shortages. So this is intentional. All these cuts are to make sure that the elderly don't have any access. So to be honest, let's cut it. Let's cut it 100% and let us deal with the patients directly. That is not the message we're hearing from a lot of groups. <laughs> That's I'm joking. I'm joking. I just throw it open to any questions. I wanted to add one thing, too. I didn't come up with this on my own. These, these principles of free markets and medicine, taking patients seriously, taking the relationship between the physician and the patient seriously, rejecting federal money, there's an organization called the Association of American Physicians and Surgeons, and that's who they are. That's who they've been since their inception. And um, Jane Orient runs that organization, and she's the reason the Clinton health care plan didn't happen. I mean, she was just a one-man wrecking ball that stopped that, and she's working hard again against this mess that's coming out of here now. But I, I really felt like I need to say that because those the principles that – underlie our our success in our making the patient central as a as a patient and as a consumer that's that's where that comes from that's an organization if you're not familiar with is something worth familiarize yourself with yeah I, i'm very familiar with her work and okay uh, just by way back i would we used to work on capitol hill so we used to interact any any questions you know we're for transparency we don't, we obviously have some concerns about the accuracy of Medicare's CMS data, and that's another whole thing. But one of the issues that we talk a lot about is how do you differentiate between the specialists and the generalists and the value there? You know, we see particularly nurse practitioners ordering way too many drugs and tests and whatever because they don't know. And how, how can we, you know, what kind of measure can we use? It looks like your measures are pretty basic and simple. What kind of measure would show that, you know, you're getting the right diagnosis? Yeah, an easy solution to that is you let the patients pay for it. I sure see a different attitude with somebody that's got a $10,000 deductible that's paying for their surgery and then somebody that has a $500 deductible when they show up. And we just educate the patients. We'll say, you know what, the American Society of Anesthesiologists guidelines recommend that for most people like you, you don't need any lab. But if you want us to draw a lot of lab and do EKG and chest X-ray and all this other stuff, here's what it'll cost. And they say, well, I don't need that. I mean, the, ultimately, the only way to control cost is to put the patient in the canoe where the money is. I mean, they've got to they've got to be feel like they have some accountability, or they're going to want it all. The other thing, you're right. I mean, that these hundred thousand dollar bills, but we'll take fifteen thousand. The other reason that happens, and people don't really talk about this because this is really the nasty truth. These not-for-profit hospitals need all that red ink to maintain the fiction yes. 
of their not-for-profit status. They're making billions. And all this all these lies about the uninsured coming to our emergency room and they're killing us. They need that. They they wouldn't know what to do without it because they're making so much money. They have to have that red ink to maintain that fiction. So when I hear the hospital administrators poor mouthing it and then they're building a hundred and fifty million dollar new facility on the other side of town and I ask them, do you think you've overdone the cost shifting thing a little bit? I mean Building an NBA practice facility right behind my surgery center, they are they are making loads of money. So, and then they claim after charging a hundred dollars for an aspirin and getting paid five dollars, that claim they lost ninety five dollars. Then they throw that ninety five into a pool called uncompensated care, which then they leverage for disproportionate share payments off the taxpayer's back. So. There are so many scams that, and there's so many people who profit from keeping the price waters real muddy, and so you kind of don't even know what it costs. And you, you just can't imagine the storm and the ripples that are going on in Oklahoma City for me having said, this is how much this is. It's a nightmare. People that make hundreds of millions of dollars in PPO repricing, where they get they say, well, look, we reduced the price of this aspirin for a hundred, from $100 to $5. We've saved you $95. And then they go to the self-funded company and say, and they get like 30% of that savings when it's just completely false. Deal with uninsured. You told the story about that. And insured people. How do you deal with the insured? And, and you deal with uh, consumer-directed people that come in paying cash, I guess. How do you deal with the insurance companies? We... We will file insurance for patients uh, as a courtesy to them. I do not extend our Internet prices to them, though, because then I take the risk of all the employees I have to hire to pre-cert these things, then to chase the money, to fight the insurance company and appeal it, risk non-payment. The prices I have online are so close to my, to my margin that I can't, I can't <laughs> risk 1 out of 10, 2 out of 10. I don't collect on so we do file interestingly some pretty savvy people will come in pay us the internet price and then they'll go file their insurance they didn't tell us they had the insurance company completely out of their minds writes them a check for their charge master rate and they wind up making a bundle so the insurance company pays on whatever <laughs> schedule says and Turn off your mic. <laughs> <laughs> Doc, oh, go ahead. No, please. So just uh, what sort of growth have you seen, Dr. Smith, over the last, you've been in since 97? We had a, we grew constantly from 97 till about 2002, and then the, the um, corporate folks, began to have more and more success with various tools. They started having disparate deductibles between in and out of network. <clears throat> there were $2,000 penalties for going out of network, plus your deductible is three times what it was, plus you pay another 20%. And ironically, we were still cheaper at our out of network penalty then people were staying in network because a 20% difference of $60,000 is is a lot of money. It's more than we charge for anything. So it was just a lot of time on the phone explaining this, but that took its toll and it and it hurt our volume. In the last, com, right now compared to a year ago, as a result of our our outreach to CEOs of big companies, um, our relationship with this third-party administrator. We actually have a relationship with an oil company that has carved us out and has told their third-party administrator to take a hike. We'll deal with these guys ourselves. And they give us, we give them an invoice and they pay us. Right now, we're 40% busier than we were a year ago. And it's, it's primarily due to our having posted these prices. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we took a hard, we took a, we got a hard knock. I mean, they, 
the big hospitals and the insurance companies, they hurt us for a while, but we we stayed with it. Now they're sucking wind. Hi, Dr. Smith, I uh, think it's a great story how you're getting your uh, competitors to bring down uh, uh, some of their costs in response. It's only, only anecdotal. Are you seeing other evidence that uh, that you have some imitators out there, that there might be other surgical centers that would follow your business plan? Because it sounds pretty successful. The only thing that I've seen, we have, there's a broker in Canada named Rick Baker who runs a company called Timely Medical Alternatives, and he helps the Canadians get out of line. And he sends us a lot of Canadians. He'll call me and say, I've got somebody that needs open-heart surgery, and I'll call my friend... John Harvey, who runs the Oklahoma Heart Hospital, and I said, John, this this guy probably needs this, and what you need to do is come up with a price. God, well, you know, he, how do you do that? So, but John's a smart guy, and John did it. And the Oklahoma Heart Hospital, I'm sure, is five stars on your list. They're incredible. So, John throws out this price, and this guy comes down from Canada and has surgery, and it's like the best thing in the world. Well, Galatia Heart Hospital in Kansas gets undercut with this price, so they drop their price, and so John Harvey loses all the business, and now it's going to Galatia Heart Hospital, and John hates that, so John responds, and you've got this price war going on, and in this, when I left Oklahoma City on Monday, I opened up the paper, actually my wife opened the paper, and here is this full-page ad and all these prices, the Oklahoma Heart Hospital, for all these diagnostic studies, and just thought, well, look at, look at what we've done. Mm -hmm. I mean, look, because there's an orthopedic hospital right next to us, the McBride Clinic Hospital, which is probably also five stars, and they are doing packaged pricing, too, for total hips and total knees, and they've got a lot of Canadians coming down, too. So in Oklahoma City, yes, the you're know, kind of dragging people along because there's work out there for them if they adopt this strategy. But anybody else posting prices online, I don't know of anyone. Unless it's LASIK or there's a guy in Dallas, I think, that's posting prices for bariatric surgery. There's a little bit of that kind of stuff out there. Plastic surgeons are always transparent. So you, to, to follow up, you say that a, a broker in Canada has helped instigate some of this. So maybe the broker is is a key part of the business model. Could be. He he's helping desperate Canadians, most of them needing elective surgery, but some needing life-saving procedures. He's helping them get out of line. Um, but I extend to him, you know, the internet price, and he tags on whatever he needs to on his end. But, you know, without him, they'd never find us. Well, thank goodness for desperate Canadians. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully we won't be going up there to have our surgery. Well, one of the things, I just a quick question here. Um, and we're kind of running out of time. Um, a long time ago, uh, there was a member of Congress who was trying to enact transparency legislation specific to the cost uh, issue. And um, a hospital executive uh, told the, this congressperson's staffer that um, no one cares about the cost, no one cares about the price. What they care about if they're insured is what do I end up paying, i.e., what's my deductible, what's my coinsurance, what's my copay. If we're thinking about a world in 2014 and beyond where we've got um, perhaps 30 million, maybe more, people entering um, the ranks of the insured, what's your thought about how those folks are going to care about um, w what you're doing as a business model? They're not. Yeah. And the implication of that is? cost is going to go crazy. Demand, I mean, if it's perceived as free, what's the demand? It's insane. Yeah, it's like what you said about plastic surgery, being transparent. They put their prices up on the line because everybody's paying cash for that. But if, I guess what I'm getting at is um, whether it's under um, 
the pea packet structure, whether it's under some alternative structure, maybe it's this huge upswing in market demand, um, people want to get become covered. Um, is there value in both uh, releasing information on what the consumer pays as well as um, what's paid to the facility or the uh, physician? But I think you let the market do it. I would be against mandating transparency. Okay. If we continue to do what we're doing and my competitors do not post their prices, I'm going to crush them because people are going to want to know well, why don't you put your prices out there? This outfit does, and I'll ruin them. You know, the government will give you a second chance, but the market won't. It's the harshest disciplinarian out there, and anybody who runs a business knows that. I think mandating transparency, I, I would have a problem with that. I think the market will ruin, ultimately will ruin anyone that doesn't do it. That's, that's the way I would look at it. We don't necessarily want to be the cheapest player out there, but where those curves cross, that's that's the value. We put our infection rate online, and uh, we'll post our patient satisfaction surveys. Um, but it, yeah, it's a it's a value proposition. More question: What's the wait time to get into your surgical center? When someone calls our internet hotline, they will see a surgeon that day or the next day. What was it in Boston? Fifty. Yeah, it's one day, unless they're unless they can't get there. But the delay is not on our end. But it's within 24 hours is my pledge to them. Your waiting room is empty. Huh? There's nobody sitting around waiting. That's, that's it's full and then it's empty and then it's full again and then it's empty. But the the interesting thing, I mean, the, the geographic variation is interesting, but um, it's probably also pretty interesting if you look at it by payer, particularly Medicare and Medicaid some of the surveys that come out of MedPAC about um, ability to find a new primary care doc or ability to get access to a specialist today for Medicare patients is um, is pretty interesting as well. Price controls cause shortages. There's shortages. Price There's controls cause shortages. I mean, nobody wants to see them. Most of the surgeons I know rather see Medicaid patients than Medicare patients because they're poor. They kind of feel sorry for them. But you bring in a guy who is a very, very wealthy CEO of a company or retired, loaded, who's 67 years old and is demanding, he's Medicare. None of the surgeons I work with want to see that guy. So that few of those guys have trouble with access, and we'll see something change. It has been fascinating discussion. I really appreciate your expertise and your um, thoughts. Thanks for having us.